Also, the uh, web stream on YouTube should now be just about going live. Um, it's just starting up here any second. So if you're over, well, I guess if you're on U YouTube, you won't see this yet, but you'll see this in a second. Also, the uh, web stream on YouTube. Also, the uh, web stream on YouTube should Oops. now be just about going live. Hold on. Um, <laughs> this is some echo. Any second, so. <laughs> Sorry, that, that was echo on the delay of my web stream. Let me get all these turned off before I... People can see that, I assume. Is that okay? Yep, great. I can't see the interpreter on the. People can see that, I assume. Is that okay? Yep, great. I can't see the interpreter on the YouTube. Yep, okay. Let me figure that out. I'm not 100% sure we will have the interpreter on the YouTube. We are going to have, I will be recording this live and then we will post the recorded event onto the YouTube, uh, onto YouTube. Um, in general, people, if, I think to get interpreter, to have control over interpreters, they'd need to um, be on the Zoom channel if they want it live. I will get the final version up though. Um, Jack, if you can spotlight the interpreter, yep. then um, it should probably appear in the YouTube. And also if we all switch our, off our videos after uh, when everybody else is- um, Oh, great. Yeah, I see spotlight for everyone. That's great, perfect. That should do it, right? Okay, we're at 226, it's a bit slow. Um, the loading, I might just get going here pretty soon. Um, I'll give people a couple more minutes to join in, but the numbers seem to be coming in relatively slow now. Okay, then I'm going to get started here. Thank you everyone for joining us. Um, welcome to the to the Birmingham lectures, um, lang the Birmingham lectures series on language structure and lang language use. Um, it's really a pleasure to have everyone here today. Um, and um, sorry, I'm just getting this set up here. Great. Okay, so um, my name is Jack Reeve. I'm a professor here at the University of Birmingham in Corpus Linguistics in the Department of English Language and uh, Linguistics, and I'm going to be the moderator for the series. Um, I'm going to be the moderator for, 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 for this series over the next uh, month or so. Um, I'm really excited to be kicking off our Birmingham, lecture, uh, our Birmingham series this, this week with Ted Gibson, 
um, from MIT. And I'm going to introduce Ted in a second, um, but first, since this is the first talk in our new series, I'd like to just take a couple minutes um, to introduce the series and our format here. Um, let me just give you this. So this is our um, kind of our general schedule, um, which ho hopefully you'll be able to join us for. So the idea here is that we really want to bring together leading linguists from all over the world, really, um, in a in a series of over a series of weeks to discuss their research um, and how it links up with this theme, um, the relationship between language structure and language use. Um, and we really hope that this is a, a theme that will be of interest to linguists and language scientists from across academia. Um, we also really want to try to take advantage of this online format uh, so that we could bring people together from around the world, uh, both our speakers and the audience, um, and also from different backgrounds in linguistics. I mean, we often don't have a chance to bring people together who work in all sorts of different parts of linguistics to speak together. Um, and really, hopefully, we're trying to get some extended discussion here going um, on what I think, at least, is a really a fundamental topic for our field. Um, to that end, um, to that end, um, the lectures throughout the series will run for about 45 minutes. So we're going to have a 45 minute talk today from Ted, um, and then they're going to be followed up by 45 minutes or so of questions from our panel, um, and that's going to include speakers from the series um, as well as from as well as Birmingham academics. Um, so in particular, we have everyone here today, and I'd really like to thank everyone for joining us. Uh, so uh, from 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 future weeks, we have Adele Goldberg. David Adger, Dagmar Diviak, uh, Martin Haspelmath, um, who will all be speaking later in the series, and they'll be joined uh, by Jeanette, Jeanette Littlemore, Adam Shembury, and Bodo Winter from our department. Um, we'll also be taking questions from the floor, so please do use the question and answer function in Zoom uh, if you have questions, and I will follow those up um, throughout the, um, well, during, during the question period. Sorry, I'm just getting some comments here. Let me just make sure I'm not having any kind of issues. Um, um, I'd also like to just take this chance to highlight um, that Adele will be talking next week um, at the same time. Her talk is titled The Usage-Based Constructionist Approach Where Lexical Semantics Meets Grammar. So please do sign up for that. Um, and then I would also just like to highlight that we have closed captioning and BSL interpretation going. Um, so um, you, you can turn on the closed captioning yourself in Zoom, um, and I have uh, spotlighted the, um, the closed captioning um, um, video for, I'm sorry, the, um, the interpretation video from our, um, from our two interpreters tonight, uh, Naomi Byrne and Chris Stone. Uh, we'll also be joined by Mark Schofield in future weeks as well, so I'd like to thank them all. Um, like I said, we're also live streaming these and archiving these sessions to YouTube. Um, so you can also check them out there or watch, watch them in the future. And I'd also like to especially thank Matt Cluley from the University of Birmingham, who's uh, been providing a ton of technical support. We really couldn't have done it without him. Um, although if there's any hiccups and I fear there might already be a few, uh, that would be my fault. Um, anyway, thank you very much for everyone for joining us. Um, let's get on now with uh, Ted's lecture. I'm gonna turn this off the share and, and put this over to Ted now. Thank you. Great. Um, Ted, um, if you want to put up your slides, that's great. And let me just maybe do a quick um, introduction here um, uh, to your talk. Great. Thank you. Okay. So it's really my pleasure to introduce Ted Gibson uh, today, who will be presenting his talk um, and the first talk in, in the series. Um, it's entitled, as you can see, Information Processing Explains Cross-Linguistic Universals. Um, I think most of us probably know about Ted's research. Um, but if you don't, it's definitely worth checking out, and I think this will be a great in, in introduction today. Um, Ted is a professor of cognitive science in the Department of Brain and Cognitive Sciences at MIT, um, where he leads TED Lab, his, his group, uh, which really use a wide range of different advanced empirical methods to better understand the structure of language. And I think it's just a perfect um, sort of start for our um, series on um, language structure and lang language use. Um, I think it's notable that Ted's really generated both a steady stream of top young academics in, in, in linguistics and psychology, uh, but also of really impactful and challenging research that's often quite controversial. So I'm really happy that he could join us to start our new series um, by walking us through some of these studies, 
um, that him and his group have done in order to really show us how factors that are related to the general processing of information um, can help explain the basic structures that characterize all human languages. Uh, so without delay, uh, let's turn it over to Ted. I'm, I'm really glad to have him here. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Jack. And a thank you to uh, Jack, Adam, Jeanette, and Bodo for organizing this exciting series. And um, I'm really deeply honored to be part of this lineup. I'm very happy you asked me, and I hope I can um, interest and entertain you uh, for this next little while for 45 or perhaps 50 minutes. And so I, the title of this presentation is Information Processing Explains Cross-Linguistic Universals. Let's just say I realize it's a bit of an ambitious title for, an, for a research program, but um, as also Jack says, I don't shy away from trying to be a little bit um, maybe you know challenging or controversial in some way. Okay, so um, thank you very much to to you for to you um, Birmingham people for organizing this. Um, the uh, because language is used for transferring information in social environments. Many recent theories have sought to quantitatively test whether languages may under pressure to be structured so as to facilitate communication. Modern work in this area builds on a rich history of usage-based linguistics, maybe starting with, uh, well, Joan Bybee's pretty late in the game there in some ways, but Joan Bybee certainly I think of as a uh, mother of this field in some ways, and formalizes and quantitatively evaluates these hypotheses using tools of information theory due to Shannon. And so today I wanna to walk uh, talk to you talk to you about how communicative communication pressure memory and culture might shape aspects of human language including words in lexicon and word order uh, such that the form of human language might exhibit a strong tendency to be structured for efficient use that's the broad goal what i'm going to tell you today i'm going to hit four topics two in words and two in sentences and i'll tell you more about the sent those when I get to them. Okay, so first let's start with words. So this is a pretty simple one to start with. So uh, why do words have the shapes that they do, the lengths that they do, is is a, a research question. Um, going back to Zip, you know, the idea is that it might be more efficient for speakers and hearers alike if the most frequent things that I want to say are shorter. So I don't have to say so much and you don't have to hear so much to get the same message across. That's the, this old George Kingsley Zipf idea that princ principle of least effort. And sure enough, it's true that high frequency words tend to be short. There's some examples from English and low frequency words uh, tend to be longer. And there's a bunch of long, long low frequency words there. Um, a student of mine at the time, Steve Piandadosi, uh, notice that there's lots of words that violate these kinds of constraints, that there's lots of short words, which are really infrequent, what's going on there. So Steve is now a faculty member in Berkeley. Uh, he was a student at MIT a few years ago. Um, and his idea, so those words like a back and yonder, these are very low frequency English words and yet very short. How can they survive? Uh, and his idea is that maybe, you know, word frequency independent of context isn't quite the right measure. Maybe it's predictability in the local con context, which can enable uh, shortness in a way. And so not, not necessarily independent of context. So words that are more predictable across contexts tend to be shorter. And so the idea here is just use surprisal. So predictable words might be shorter. And so we just look across all possible contexts can someone nod if you can see my mouse? I hope you can see my mouse. Jack, can you, you know, good, good. Okay, so a back tends to occur, almost always occurs, in fact, uh, after some form of take. A word, a word like yonder almost always occurs after a preposition like over. And so the, the context in which these words appear are extremely predictable, leading to possibly allowing these words to be short because they're predictable. And so what Steve did was look at um, pr predictability, negative log probability, uh, and just very simple notion of context here, which is just you know n grams, either two, three, or four grams over very big corpora across a bunch of languages. And so the idea is that the preceding two words might allow you to predict a word like a back. And so it's very predictable in the local context. There's a lot of con consistency across those contexts. And so the predictability might predict the length. And sure enough, that's what he found in a paper in, well, we found in a paper in 2011, we did this work in 2009, Google released corpora from 
11 languages. And so I'll just, here's English, they're all kind of similar here. So these dashed lines are the correlation between word length and word frequency, the zip correlation. It's reliable in all languages. And this, re this relationship between predictability and word length is even bigger in almost all these languages. It's numerically bigger in all, I guess it's not quite reliably bigger in, in these data from Polish, but it's bigger in all the rest. Um, so the predictability is in a, in sort of an even better predictor of word length across, across the world's language. This is for three grams for the preceding two predicting the third, if the same thing happens really for two grams or four grams. Um, so, oh, and then there's these little uh, triangles in each one of these bars here is the, the, this factor, so predictability partialing out the other, partialing out um, word frequency independent of context, and you, you see that those triangles stay up. These triangles inside the predictability, the, the frequency ones go down a lot. Maybe what's going on here is the predictability is driving a lot of this as opposed to word frequency independent of context. And I think ZIP, we think ZIP would have been very happy with this. It's just that the data, sorry, the, yeah, the corpora weren't available in his time, so he couldn't evaluate this. And also information theory was just in its infancy stage. And so that was when Claude Shannon was just doing his work. Jasmine Kenwall and colleagues in a paper in 2017 in Cognition explored this effect in a communication game experimentally and found that there needs to be pressure on both being correct, accuracy, and time doing it quickly in order for the effect to be observed to actually watch words get shorter over time in predictable contexts, but um, that seems not crazy in, a norm, in, in human language as well, in typical language development. And finally, I sort of a shout out to uh, Michael Ramskar is doing lots of interesting uh, exploring fascinating dis distributions of different kinds of words, such as names, and finding lots of interesting effects consistent with communication-based theories of words uh, across languages. So that's my quick first uh, um, universal is that maybe predictability predicts word length uh, across languages to some degree. And now what I want to do in the second word um, section is apply information theoretic approach, that general approach to explain how words get added to a lexicon, not how they get shortened, but how they get added to a lexicon within a particular set of meanings here. I'm going to focus on color words because that's what we've worked on and the fields worked on somewhat, got worked on a lot. And, and so according to a kind of a usage-based idea, which is, you know, communication, communication efficiency, use-based idea, maybe people invent words for properties of objects, if we're talking about properties here, that differentiate those objects from other objects. That's why I might need a word is to, in, you know, I need to be able to tell two objects apart. And so I invent a new word to tell them apart. So that's where maybe color terms come in. Uh, that's a use-based word to think about why we might add words to it in a dictionary. Um, so uh, people with normal trichromatic vision can see literally millions of different colors, but our language system categorizes these into some small, relatively small set of words. In, a, in an industrialized culture, maybe you know only 12 words for colors. Uh, probably you know more than that, but you know, you know, maybe if you're an interior designer or a painter, you might know as many as 100 words for color, but still it's a tiny fraction of the colors that you can see and distinguish. Um, but interestingly, the the ways that languages categorize color varies widely across languages, such that non-industrialized cultures have many fewer words for colors than industrialized cultures. And the goal of our project here that I'm describing here, it was to figure out maybe why cultures vary so much in their color word, color word usage. And, and this set of colors here is a set of 80, well, it's kind of a, a, a rough visual presentation of 80 maximally, maximally saturated color chips, which are equally distant perceptually from their adjacent neighbors. This is, this is a Munsell, part of the Munsell color set, which is a particular perceptual color set that people have used in researchers in the World Color Survey used to ask what words different cultures have for color. And it's been, it's been long, long been known that languages, you know, uh, divide the space really differently. So an industrialized language like English or Japanese, we might have 11 basic terms, terms that everyone knows, or 11 or 12 that everyone knows. Whereas a non-industrialized culture like Burinmo and Papua New Guinea uh, has only five terms that people agree on. And cultures may have as few as two, such as the Danai, which also in Papua New Guinea, which only have basically terms for black and white. The, it's an open, it has been an open question as to why cultures vary so much of the set of color terms that they, they have and why it is that industrialized populations have more terms. Up until 2017, the best theory of why languages vary in their color terms was due to Berlin and Kay, 
who published a famous paper in 1969 and published several other papers with similar claims after that. Uh, Berlin, and Clay, Berlin and Kate collected a large amount of color naming data in what they called the, col the World Color Survey. Originally, that was from 20 languages. Um, but then the, the modern set, which we have available widely on, uh, you can get it on the Berkeley website, has data from 110 non-industrialized cultures. And the, an observation from Berlin and Kay from their initial subset of 20 languages, which is not the same as the 110, um, is that there was an approximately a subset relation among sets of color terms across languages. So if a language only had two, two, two terms, that would be, they'd be corresponding to English, black and white. If there's a third, then it would correspond to red. If there's a fourth, it would correspond to green or yellow, English. And uh, if there was a fifth, it would be the other. If it's a sixth, it's blue and so on. Um, and and sort of in order to explain what they found was an apparent subset relationship, they hypothesized that the color categorizations across languages are somehow are due to how the visual system works. Maybe black, white, and red are the most salient to the visual system, so they label they're labeled first, and so on. They thought this would ground out somehow in neurophysiology, um, uh, right? So it's the visual system here, but th that has not happened. <laughs> so um, there is actually no evidence from neurophysiology for this approach. Um, and furthermore, the subset relation is messier than initially thought. Uh, it hasn't really held up the close, close scrutiny. Some of these generalizations are true. It's true if you only have two words, they're black and white. It's true if it's a third, it's red. But after that, it's really messy. It's more messy. OK, there's a lot of exceptions. Um, one way to think about this in a way is that it may be a kind of an Anglo-centric view of color words, color terms in a way. It's originally based on speak these first 20 languages were people from the San Francisco Bay Area where Berkeley is, you know, right there. And all of those speakers were actually multilingual. They're more bilingual with English. So there may have been some possibly an English bias to some original claim. Um, that's not true with the rest of the data. So the 110 languages they gathered data from are monolingual speakers, mostly monolinguals um, from uh, remote remoter groups, you know, uh, and so they're not, that's not a problem there. But then that's where you see lots of weird stuff going on, not very easy to see this um, uh, order in that data set. So what we, what my, our people and other people's, I'm not the only one, other people um, have per per pursuing a different kind of idea is to think of why color terms exist within a language, and that's in terms of color communication. And so, you know, following up on other researchers in the area thinking of, thinking of this problem in terms of color communication, like uh, Terry Regeer's group and, and, and Charles Kemp. Um, so the idea here is that I have a color that I want to convey to you using a word. And so maybe I've got one of these colors in my head, which I'm trying to convey to you and say, I, I want to say this one. That's the thing I want to tell you about. And I choose a word. And in terms of information theory or communication here, the idea is how well do I get that physical color into your head using a word? Okay, how, and so we can think of that in information theoretic terms, how many bits of information it takes to get that across. One way you might think about this is how many guesses it might take you, the listener, to figure out which of these chips, if I have 80 chips here, I meant given the word that I said, and you can choose any, you, your guess could be any set of chips, and I'm told yes or no, that's kind of a yes, no questions you're asked about this. That's kind of roughly, this is not a task that anyone's doing, this is kind of a way to think about what, how, how we're conveying information um, in terms of uh, bits here. And so for any particular color, say this one right here, the number of guesses it takes for you to figure out which color I meant given the word I use depends on how consistently people label this color. That's this thing here, the probability of a word given the color. You can measure that kind of directly in a population just by asking people to label this thing. And we can see if people reliably call that say green or something, okay. Um, if, if that comes off as a green to you. I'm not sure what, I think it was pointing to this one. Uh, and, and then the other factor which affects how easily I convey this particular color to you affects, it, it's affected by how many other things might be labeled by that some word, that same word. So the probability of, of that color given the word green. So if there's a lot of other things which are also called green and I say green to you, you might think I meant this or this or this as opposed to this one, right? And so we can talk about the number of bits it takes here, roughly a lower bound on this in some way uh, of information to be conveyed is the sum over all possible words of this, uh, the probability of the word given the color and then the surprisal of, of, of associated with the, with the color given the word. 
we can measure this. I told you we can measure this thing directly by just asking lots of people within a population. So we can take the World Color Survey and get an estimate for any one of these colors uh, uh, across around 30 participants as we got. This thing we don't have directly and we have to compute this. The probability of a color given word, uh, we have to compute this. How do we compute this? We do it by Bayes theorem from this thing, making some estimates of what the priors are on the likelihood of, of, of talking about colors, the likelihood of the words, of those color words in the in, in this, whatever the language is. We don't have good estimates. We have, we have estimates of that. We can make up estimates of those. I'm just going to, you know, there's a couple of different estimates we've used for these to try to compute this. And actually, I've been working with uh, people to try to measure this thing directly so we can get at actually what the priors are more directly. But we're just in this work, we just assumed the priors were, say, uniform or or some other kind of a prior, not 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 uh, not for words, but maybe for colors. For words, we can get a distribution over the words that people use in the in the experiment to get those maybe as a rough guess. And so then we can get a score, the average number of bits it takes to con communicate any color across these 80. Uh, and we can just look how that looks uh, across um, different for you know see see how they look across different languages. Um, and so this space recall is defined visually. So it's defined so that each chip is equally close or far from, from its neighboring chip in terms of your ability to see them as similar or different or as in rating. And so what we want to know is, are they equally, to equally easy to communicate or is the distribution somehow skewed so that people some are easier to communicate than others? And um, so the project, I actually did some work here with uh, a bunch of field work in a, in a with, with an indigenous population called the Chimani, which are in the Amazonian part of uh, Bolivia. They are a, hunt, an, an, it's a farmer foraging community of around 12,000 living on a river there. Um, and, and they have a pretty uh, um, immature color system. There's only three words that everyone uses very reliably, but there's actually a lot of other words that people use less reliably in that, in that culture. Part of the work here was done to try to figure out different aspects of the color labeling paradigms. There's multiple paradigms one might use to do this task and wanting to test whether they are all uh, are um, equally useful. It turns out they all kind of are pretty much equally useful. So the, the simplest paradigm that we use is just asking people, you know, what do you call this? What do you, what, what do you label this? That's the easiest thing to do. The instructions in the World Color Survey are actually very complicated. They're not that, but 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 that simple task is actually probably equivalent to uh, the whatever they were asking in the World Color Survey. And um, so in these, so here's what color naming looks like across, you know, what, what it might look like in English, for example, what it does look like in Bolivian Spanish is you get people to label these 80, 80 um, colors with the, and these down here, we have five actually really, really just random participants doing that labeling task. And these colors are representing words that they use in this, in the Bolivian Spanish lexicon. And what you see in the Bolivian Spanish is high agreement between participants. They pretty much do the same thing. They don't do exactly the same thing. There's differences in the borders, but pretty much they're doing the same thing across these participants. The same thing is true in English. If you go to Chimani, you see some agreement. So in reds, blacks, and whites, I don't have the blacks and whites on here, but the reds, blacks, and whites people are highly agree. And then within a participant, they're, they, they know what they're doing and they're consistent for a participant. But there's a lot of variability in how people label, for instance, the green blue space, the grew space, or uh, you know, other aspects of, of the space. There's differences. People use different words to mean the same thing for everything except for red, black, and white. So there's less consistency. So that there's basically less information. It's a harder thing to convey. These colors are harder to convey in, in Chimani. Um, but then we can just take this, this score for any of these languages and uh, compute that and just rank order them. And some of them might be easier to convey than others. And it turns out, sure enough, some of them are easier to convey. And not only are some easier to convey than others, but it's the same ones across languages that are easier to convey than others. So here's English and Spanish down here, and, and they're just rank ordered according to the easy, easy to convey low surprisal to high, high surprisal in each of the three languages. And when we, you know, first of all, you see there's actually quite a lot of variability within a language between around two bits and five bits in English and Spanish and between three and six in Chimani. So it's just shifted up by a bit of information in Chimani. And secondly, we see the same kind of total order within the languages such that warm colors are easier to convey 
then cool colors, the greens and the blues are all harder to convey in all of these three languages. Um, that observation, generalization, warm, easy, ha uh, cool, harder, uh, is, is you know, a cool generalization here across these three languages, and it doesn't follow from the Berlin K idea here, um, or unique hues if you happen to know what that is. So then what we did is we go to the World Color Survey, put English, Spanish, and Chimani first. Uh, English and Spanish have more information, so I'm going to put them higher, like they have higher, more information, they're easier to convey color, so I'll put them higher, Chimani is lower. And I'll throw them on to the World Color Survey. There's actually 110 other languages. Each row here is another language. And then I will put the rest of the languages in the World Color Survey on this grid here. And what you see is the same total order across every language in um, the whole World Color Survey and English and Spanish. And so amazingly, all languages are highly correlated in their rank ordering. Warm colors are easier to convey than cool colors. Uh, now we wanted to uh, figure out why. <laughs> Uh, and this is about use here, this idea, I mean, our idea was about use. I mean, that's is a reason why I'm here at this at this um, this uh, series of talks is I sort of think the language function has to do, language structure has to do with use. So here, maybe a causal explanation has to do with um, efficient communication, warm colors, maybe pick out objects against backgrounds of cool colors. Okay, so the things we want to label are the objects, those tend to be warm colored backgrounds tend to be cool colors. We test this by uh, compare, comparing color chips rank ordered by their surprisal, their basically entropy, to the likelihood that a color will be find in, found in an object. We do that. The colors of the natural objects in the backgrounds were taken from 20,000 images in a Microsoft research database, which is open access, each which is hand coded, which someone else coded. We have nothing to do with that each one which is hand coded for what's an object and what's a background. And strikingly, we see uh, the likelihood that a color would be found in an object is highly correlated with the surprisal of the colors such that low surprisal colors are much more likely to be in objects. High surprisal colors are much more likely to be in background. So we've got here, these are high surprisal down here. Probability it's in an object, sorry, is, is very low. It's like 0.1. These are low surprisal colors here and they are much, much more highly much more likely to be in objects. And you know, we're only down at we're only as high as 0.5 or 0.6 here because there's a lot more background <laughs> than there is objects in any one of these scenes. Okay, so that's just you know an overall main effect. Um, and so this is this is for Chimani, but the figures look the same across all languages. So we now we've established a potential causal connection between warm cool and uh, and objects versus backgrounds. Okay, in the real world, people want to talk about objects, so they label colors more often, more than in the backgrounds. And so, in summary, we see that all cultures bring words into their languages asymmetrically. They bring more words into the warm part of the space first. So, in English, there are more words in the warm space. You've got yellow, orange, yellow, orange, red, brown, and pink. Whereas uh, in the cool part of the space, there's just blue and green. It's a big part of the space, and there's not many words in there. English and industrialized cultures have more color terms. Chimani and non-industrialized cultures have fewer, but the asymmetry is always there, and, and which is predicted by the communicative efficiency. So I've told you here in this section about, uh, you know, uh, I told you about a cross-linguistic universal. It's a, I think it's a true universal that warm is easier to convey than cool, which is really, uh, I found really quite astounding when we first found that. Um, and then we also remarkably find a nice simple story for that, which has got to do with uh, objects versus backgrounds. We want to talk about objects as opposed to backgrounds. I haven't told you why it is maybe that industrialized cultures have more color terms than non-industrialized cultures. Here it's a little, um, the, the date is a little um, less certain, but the idea is just that in the industrialized world, we have way more objects which are minimally different on their color than in a non-industrialized world. So industrialized objects allow us to um, arbitrarily color any object, and then color becomes really important as a language term, be able to tell people, we have to be able to tell people what, um, how, to, how to get which object using color terms. That's the idea there. Okay, so that's um, what I'm gonna tell you about words. I'm halfway through, well, kind of. I'm a little less than halfway through in terms of time. Oh, oh no, I'll tell you, just, I should just uh, shout out to Noga Zaslavsky. She's done some really nice work 
um, there's a paper in 2018 providing more general rate distortion framework for word evolution, which is called the information bottleneck hypothesis, which is a trade off in accuracy in getting your message across with the complexity of the language. And she's got data uh, and analyses of color and other um, domains. And Frank Mollico actually has some nice um, analyses using this informational information bottleneck hypothesis to explain meaning across a word. Uh, word introductions across multiple semantic domains as well. Okay, so now I, I, I sort of jumped ahead of myself there. Now I want to move on to syntax. Um, we don't just work on words. Words are super interesting, but we also work on um, how words get put together compositionally in some way, syntax. Um, and so the first thing I want to tell you about is an, a, a universal we've observed and other people have observed that all languages minimize dependency length to some degree. This is a work by Richard Futrell. Um, who's, who was a student also in my lab with, also with Kyle Mowald, also a student. Now we're faculty, they're professors down in California also in uh, Irvine with Richard and uh, Santa Barbara for Kyle. And this is following work on uh, uh, Gildea and Temperley in 2007 using the same kind of methods they're using and um, finding generalizations similar to those of Liu from 2008 using slightly different metrics, but very similar idea. And so, I, I think it's reasonably well established that syntactic structures with longer distance dependencies are harder to process than more local ones. This is why when you read or hear one of these sentences I'm gonna show you now, each one of which has a long distance dependency which you need to get to the intended meaning, it's hard to ignore a more local de dependency connection which has some unintended, in these cases, sort of funny interpretation. So here's a headline, I'm from Toronto, I'm Canadian. Um, here's a headline from a Toronto newspaper from the, I think it was the late 70s, Toronto law to protect squirrels hit by mayor. And the idea here is that, is that the law um, was attacked by the mayor and uh, what, but, but it's kind of hard to not note, not, not to think of something sort of funny here, which is maybe, maybe the law is to help the squirrels who were attacked by the mayor, you know, which is not what was intended, but it is kind of weird and funny. It's, and the idea is that that's a local connection, which you sort of can't ignore. Here's another example from a uh, poor, poorly worded sign in English in front of a, friend, a, a Russian graveyard, where it, it says here, you can visit the cemetery where famous Russian composers are buried daily, except Thursday. I don't know if people can hear a screaming child in my background, <laughs> but that's, that's, that's Zoom for you. <laughs> that's my daughter. I was a little unhappy at the moment. Um, anyway, so you can visit the cemetery where famous Russian composers are buried daily except Thursday is funny because even though I think it's funny because daily except Thursday should go to visit, but the uh, intent, but you can't help but notice buried dead daily except Thursday, even though that's, that's obviously crazy. Okay, I hope. Anyway, um, to evaluate whether languages uh, tend to minimize dependency lengths, we you know, used and collected some database of parsed sentences across a bunch of languages. In fact, initially it was 37 languages. We mostly got from the Universal Dependencies Corpus. We had to, Richard had to make some on his own somehow, but then the Universal Dependency Corpora is even bigger now. It's up to 55 languages at least that we can evaluate this in, where each sentence is parsed into a dependency structure. And then for each dependency structure in each corpus, we compute the total dependency distances, distance for that sentence in terms of the words, the distance between those dependencies in words for simplicity. Um, so each sentence in any one of these corpora has a head word. So through in this one up here, and actually through is the head in both of these, is the head. Um, these are examples that we just created. They're not part of the UD, Universal Dependency Corpora, but to show two different dependency structures is what we're trying to show here. So for each dependency structure, we're trying to create, compare actual dependency lengths to some baseline. The baseline we're gonna compare it to is um, for each dependency structure in each text, we'll, we'll start at the root. Um, and what we're gonna do is find some different way in some weird, other language of saying the same thing. So what we'll do is scramble the word order of these starting at the root. So we'll take through and its dependents, John, out, and trash, scramble those in some arbitrary order, and then go down the tree, go down the dependency structure, and do that now for trash, scramble all those things in some arbitrary order, and do it all the way down to the bottom of the tree. And then then do that 100 times for this tree, for every tr for every dependency structure in the corpora corpus, and then and then take see what the distances are in those, um, you know, differently worded 
uh, um, uh, ways of getting across the same meaning. That's a, that's a baseline. And actually, it's a little more conservative than that. And so we did this 100 times then for every sentence to get some average there. And then we compare, com compare the resulting average dependency lengths to what to the, in, the, in the scrambled sentences, the one we see in the original sentence structures. And we do a little more, a little more conservative than that. We take a more constrained baseline. We constrain the choices in the random structures to be so-called projective, which means they have to follow a context-free grammar. You don't allow cross dependencies. Otherwise, Ferrari Concho has showed that you get many, many longer distance dependencies in the baseline that way. So that wouldn't be a very, um, a, not, not necessarily the best um, control. So actually Ferrari Concho has argued that maybe the reason we have context-free grammars is to minimize dependency lengths. So that, you know, but we're just still um, abstracting away from that here. We have data. We have originally we had 37 languages from nine families. Uh, now there's 55. They look the same. There's you know, a lot of Indo-European here, but there are eight other families represented in that in that initial um, analysis. Um, yeah, and so here's what the 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 figure looks like for each of the 37 languages. So let's just choose one of these. Here's English again. Sorry, I'm very. Anglo-centric here, but there are 36 other languages. You can look at any one of those. On the x-axis is the sentence length. It's going from your very short to long sentences. On the y-axis is the total dependency length for the average for, for those, for whatever length that is, uh, for, uh, for whatever sentence length that is. And what you see is that the blue line, which is what actually occurs in the, in the real corpora, is below the conservative baseline that I told you about. And if you have a non-conservative baseline, it's crazy over here. That's the, like the Ferrari Concho idea. OK, so here, this is below for all those. And it's above this green optimal baseline. That, that, that optimal baseline is if you chose the closest um, way, the, the most local connection for no matter for every single um, choice, no matter what. Uh, which is, you know, violating the word order of, you know, there are grammar rules within a language which probably make the language languages easier to learn, and you're just ignoring those. Okay, if you ignore those, <clears throat> which are, you know, those. Okay, this is, I think, um, the first quantitative syntactic universal, as far as we know. I mean, there's no no uh, exceptions to this so far. Like now, it's up to 55 that have been been um, explored. Um, uh, and we can see there's some variability between languages, uh, which I'm not going to talk about here. So some languages are like English are closer to the you know the optimal baseline. Some languages like I don't know Chinese and you know just Mandarin and German are kind of closer to the conservative baseline. And there's things in between. Partly those things you know there's a lot of factors which determine that, which um, I'm not going to talk about. But other people have, have, have interesting things to say about um, since. Okay, so what we see, I'm going to tell you, is the result is that all languages minimize dependency distances. Then we can also do some probabilistic grammar modeling when we choose um, the most likely order of a head and its dependence, abstracting over words to make a grammar. So we're going to get for any one of these languages, we can pull out some rules like s goes to to a subject, a verb, and an object in English, or I'm sorry, a sentence is is a you know a subject, an object, and a verb in Japanese. So a head 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 medial versus head final, different word order in English versus Japanese, for example. And then we can look to see if samples from that grammar have lower dependency length than the random projective baseline. And if they do, that's evidence that the grammar minimizes dependency length. And in, and we see that that's true also. And and then we then we see if we see real dependency length is shorter than the samples from the grammar. That's evidence for the dependency length minimization and usage. And we see evidence. Of, of both of those. So um, this means, this likely means that human grammars are constrained by memory limitations. That's what's probably driving this. Um, we want rule systems that allow more local dependencies compared to longer distance ones. And so one generalization here maybe is the, the head direction generalization, which is noticed by many linguists, um, you know, starting with Greenberg, I think, um, may follow from the dependency length um, generalization. If a language has head initial or head final dependencies for some heads, it'll typically have matching head direction, um, say for verbs, then it'll have it from for complementizer verb or for preposition noun verb nouns, for example, it'll have similar things for other heads. And now I'm going to push, you know, pitch you to other more recent work on this. Uh, Michael Hahn has done some really great work with Dan Jurasky and Richard Futrell. And Michael Hahn has done some other work with uh, Yang, uh, Yang Shu. Um, uh, exploring other aspects of how these, you know, explaining uh, aspects of these word orders further. And I'm not going to talk about those for 
the interests of time. Um, so in the last section, I still have, I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna give you another 15 minutes here in this last section, which is um, sort of less worked out in some ways, but it's also, you know, it's, uh, I'm, um, it's also the newest of, th of the things I'm gonna talk about here today. I'm gonna do something a little bit different. I'm gonna look at evidence that's been given for a syntactic centered theory of language and see how we can account for those kinds of phenomena within a usage-based theory of, of, uh, of language, you know, based on meaning and not just forms. And so I'm gonna look at islands, so-called island phenomena, which have been famous in the syntax literature, the, in certain aspects, in certain areas of the syntax literature, and I see might, might handle them in a use-based theory. And here I'm gonna say things which might be um, interesting and controversial in some ways, and it's kind of work in progress. And so um, in a constructivist theory of language, you have minimal meaning units, these morphemes or words, which are associated with minimal meaning. Uh, and we have, we have combinations of those uh, rules of compositionality, each with a form and a meaning, okay? Um, this is, these are constructions in uh, Goldberg's terms, or as you can see, Jack and Doff's recent work, work, recent work or Kolgover and uh, Jack and Doff's simpler syntax, or kind of related to uh, Tim O'Donnell's work in morphology. So critically, each of these is highly sensitive to frequency of use in, in the grammar, okay? Um, uh, for which we actually, you know, there's people are very sensitive to that kind of frequency at both at the word and morphological level and at the combinatory level in various kinds of dependent measures and experiments. This contrasts, so these, you know, these, these constructivist kind of ways of thinking about things have natural ways to um, model that. It contrasts a little bit with the Chomsky view, which ignores um, the, the use frequency. It focuses instead on possible versus impossible, you know, which focuses the attention on the existence of some sort of categorical boundary between possible and impossible, which I'm, I don't know if it's true or if it isn't true. I haven't seen any evidence for it if it is true, but um, I'm not, you know, I'm just going to, so frequency I think is a very important part of, of language. Um, we probably want to account for that. Um, in addition to assuming some core language knowledge, uh, in, 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 so in the form of how to for, make lexical entries and constructions, I um, probably want to assume some core social knowledge. So a distinction between what's new, new information, advancing the, the discourse focus, uh, discourse and, and what is known anchoring the utterance in existing knowledge of, of the discourse. And so I'm going to assume that's continuous also. We know, you know, some things are more certainly background, some things are more certainly new, and there's some continuum in between there, which we know about. Um, I'll say more about this later. Okay, and that, and that I, uh, right. And that's similar to, I think, um, work by these authors that I'm citing here. Okay. Um, in contrast, the, as I sort of mentioned briefly, there the you know the dominant a dominant theory of language is Chomsky's syntax-based approach. In the in this approach, it starts with a, a merge idea where you you build structures locally, but then move them anywhere, uh, and then constrain that movement by a universal grammar, some you know universal constraints which are possibly parameterized, blocking movement in some ways. Okay, so, and those are like one idea is old here is subjacency or barriers. To movement and uh, there's other maybe more recent versions of this. I know these two versions pretty reasonably well. Uh, and I should mention, I actually tried to work on this. I've tried to work on this framework, this universal grammar param parameter setting principles and parameters framework. I, when I started at MIT in 1993, I worked with Chomsky and linguists to work out a principle and parameter system computational, computationally to try and show how it might be used to explain learning and cross-linguistic typology I actually have a cited, pretty slightly highly cited paper from 1994 with Ken Wexler called Triggers, where, and we worked on trying to extend that idea to many parameters within that framework. But it turns out there weren't that many that were worked out and we tried to work them out. We ended up with a system, computational systems is unpublished work of around 40 or 50 parameters with trillions of possible grammars, but which actually generated only a fraction of the world's existing languages. And I just, didn't think this was a useful framework in the end. Uh, I'm not to say that that's not to say that it's impossible. It's just I didn't that I didn't get any insights on actual language, you know, acquisition or or uh, typology from trying to work it out. And you know, that's kind of an aside. Maybe I'm just, you know, incompetent in some ways, and I, I certainly allow that possibility. <laughs> I feel incompetent many times. Anyway, I, I I just didn't get it to work. Okay, so we go back to the Chomsky and syntactic based theories of language where there are built in constraints on impossible movements. 
Um, the idea is in here is that we start with a declarative structure and you move elements around to get different meanings, different functions like WH questions or relative clauses. So from 2A, did John hear stories about Fred? You can get, what did John hear stories about? But for some reason you can't get, uh, you can't, you know, from 2B, did, story, did stories about Fred terrify John? You can't get who did stories about terrify John, that's no good. And, and, so, and so this is called a so-called island to movement or extraction. It's an unacceptable long distance connection, which is not explained by other parts of language language rules or use, by not by lexical frequency or implausibility or incongruity, in interference, nesting complexity. This is, uh, you know, uh, John Sprouse's, I mean, he didn't quite say exactly that, but that's what he means, I think. I think that's right. Um, and uh, he, he puts forward a behavioral marker of an island as a super additive interaction and acceptability such that the island structure here, these, these bad extractions, um, are, is much worse than would be predicted by the additive factors in the two by two design. So this thing over here is much worse than the other three. That's like the bad extraction out of subjects as opposed to out of an object position. So extractions and position are super additively worse for extraction from subject. And so notice when I, I just want to aside here, when I say movement, that's a theory loaded way to talk about the connections between pairs of sentences. A different way to think about them is in terms of the relationship relationship between positions as in slash category no notation or mechanism within generalized phrase structure grammar, GPSG or head driven phrase structure grammar. Um, so if I ever I say movement or fronting, just you know, from you think about there's a relationship in positions, that's all I really mean, but I often use those other metaphors. Okay. So there, there have been many examples of islands been provided in the literature with researchers asking us to infer that the source of the super additive interaction is syntax. I'm gonna conjecture, I'm not the first one, but uh, I'm gonna conjecture that all islands are actually explained by their factors, lexical frequency, implausibility, incongruity, interference, and so on. And, and I just think that the experiments just haven't been done right so far in general. And so I think they're just confounded. That's the strong claim here. Um, you know, the, uh, so I should point out, so, and that's not a new idea. Like I really, that's, that was Ivan Tsog's research program before he died. I think that was Nomi Arctic Shears kind of research. It's, you know, even though it wasn't like quite framed like that, I think that's part of Adele's, you know, she can tell you. Um, other people of maybe that, you know, it's certainly uh, Rui Chavez's research uh, in some sense. And so, um, so we think that the critical, you know, well, first of all, the critical saw is always an interaction. And without an experiment, it's, you know, it's hard to have an intuition about interactions. Like these are like bigger differences than, you know, the, the, you know, super, super linear as we we're talking about. You need an experiment for that. We've, I've, um, uh, I've, I said, as I've said before in collaboration with Deb Fedorenko. So we gotta do the experiments to say how these things are, we gotta say how these things are controlled for so other people can see if there are confounds. Um, Sprouse and colleagues results suggest that some islands aren't explained by things like interference and nesting complexity. But there's a lot of other factors which aren't investigated depth in depth there and frequency and plausibility incongruity are just as important. If we wanna conclude that the badness of islands means that we infer the difficulty is due to the syntax, the grammar independent of meaning, then we've got to control for all those things. So finding some super additive interaction just means we don't understand what's causing the difficulty of the island. It doesn't mean it's syntax in these experiments. You know, uh, it, it, so and I'd say I go as far as saying there's actually no independent evidence in any of these cases of the source of syntax. It's just a stipulation based on a vague simplicity metric for the whole grammar, which isn't really spelled out. That's my, again, I say these strong things sometimes, and so I like work with look, working with strong hypotheses. Um, so now I'm going to give you a few cases from my collaborations in which we explore the source of islands from the literature. So I'm going to give you, I think, three. Um, first, Ying Tong Liu is looked at so-called factive and manner of speaking islands as in B and C here. What did Sally whisper that Tom threw? It's not very good. What did S Linda know that Bill fixed? It's also not very good. Um, an alternative explanation. So there's been syntactic stories in the literature for why these things are bad. Uh, there's, some, there's some syntactic thing in there, which is different uh, in, in, these, in these two that's not there in the so-called bridge case, what did Mary say that Frank bought, which is okay. Um, but an alternative explanation for the badness of these examples could just be the frequency of the verb frame. And, and that's what we think it is. So whisper that is very uncommon. It's not just in extractions, across extraction and non-extractions independently. You know, know that is a little weird here. So 
it's usually given as the typical factive island, but it actually isn't, it actually isn't representative of the other factive verbs that people have investigated in terms of its verb complement frequency. The other ones are things like remember or notice or discover. So you say, what did Linda discover that Bill fixed? That's not so bad. That's also supposed to be a factive island. And these, so no is a little weird. It's given in this example. And you look at other examples, they're not like that. So um, previous results have shown an interaction between verb type and construction. But we actually don't replicate that result. We think the problem here is in terms of using a linear model in this case to model acceptability ratings uh, for very acceptable materials. In, in the non-extracted versions, these easy ones here, Sally whispered that and Linda knew that and so on, uh, the linear model fails to find differences which are real because the scale isn't, it, 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 it caps off near the end. Okay, so when we do analysis in terms of ordinal regression and that same kind of those same kinds of two by twos in a way, or a logistic regression, which don't have the problem of a cutoff at the end of the analysis scale, we see we see very simple additivity. The same difference that occurs in the extracted versions also occurs in the non-extracted simple questions. There's just, so that's these things here. They're just the same. Both of these are the same two different experiments that show the same thing. This is what we should have seen. We should see. You know, here declaratives are better overall, and there's some difference. Some maybe they should be clumped into factive and manner or something like that. But there should be some interaction so that this slope is very different. If anything, we see you know the opposite slope, but really they're just there's just nothing going on there. Uh, so we get strong evidence here, I'd say, for the simple frequency explanation of what were supposed to be syntactic islands. Okay. Um, Next, I want to. I spent a lot of time. I got like five more minutes here. Oh, that's okay. Uh, uh, talking, working with Anna Bayer, uh, Barbara Hemforth, and Elodie Winkle at the University of Paris. Um, initially, on trying to understand subject islands, as in one A and one B. I've told you a little bit. You know, who did stories about terrifying John? That's a Chomsky seventy-three example. And we actually have a just a, a shout out here for a PhD student project at the University of Paris, which is going forward. Please contact me or Anne or Barbara for more information if you or you know someone who might be interested in this. And so under the syntactic approach, these bad extractions from subject position have nothing to do with their meaning. So all extractions should be equally bad across constructions. That's you know, made very clear in this paper in, in, the, in the minimalist tradition here. Um, it turns out though, there's lots of attested examples in naturally occurring um, things that people say and write mostly of prepositional phrases that are being extracted from relative clauses as these ones in English. Here's an example from Jane Austen's writing, you know, a letter of which every line was an insult. Okay, that's an extraction out of a subject. So we ran, initially ran several experiments were reported in a recent paper in Cognition, um, which were testing the acceptability of extractions from, from subjects in both WH questions and in relative clauses. These are data from WH questions. These are data from relative clauses. In WH questions, we see the normal island effect, um, which is that the uh, extracted, uh, in fact, the subject version is much worse. This one is much worse than the three conditions. Uh, and this is not a scaling problem, no matter what the analysis is, or an regression or linear regression or, or, um, or, or logistic, you get, you get this interaction. Uh, but there's no such difference in the relative clauses. For very comparable, really comparable materials, uh, you, you actually get a suggestion of the relative clause of the subject extracting out of subject of the prepositional phrase is a little bit better than out of the object for these for these materials in English. There's no interaction there. There's just like main effects here. It's it's, it's a three way interaction, different, very different from the WH questions here. Um, so these results run totally contrary to the syntactic view. The effects should be the same across constructions, and they're really different. So what's going on here? We take a constructivist approach that uh, rules are learnable from exposure. And our hypothesis is um, that there are meanings associated with which each of the rule types, WA questions versus relative clauses. And these meanings aren't controlled across these two experiments. So in particular, the meaning of a WH question is a focus. I've drawn it here, you know, it's focus. You know, I've drawn HPSG kind of style uh, syntactic rules with their meanings. And this, this question mark X here is like the meaning um, of the WH question means that the you know, X is what the person wants to find out from the in, from her interlocutor. It's the focus of, of, of the utterance. That's like, you know, who or what or which something or other here. Um, and so, in, in, and then, um, right, so that's the focus. And for extraction from subjects, we run into a conflict here, a meaning problem. Subjects are topics, right? Subjects are topics. Uh, topics are usually backgrounded. 
uh, which is the opposite of a focus. The domain of a focused element is determined by the phrase just above dominating that element. So trying to focus part of a subject results in trying to focus a backgrounded element, this is the subject, which is a conflict with, with, with the focus. And so that's a conflict in innate social conventions here. Um, and so uh, focusing part, but, but focusing part of an object's fine because that's part of the typical focus of a sentence. And on the other hand, in a relative clause, we're, we don't have a focal meaning. The meaning of a relative clause is to add property P of X to the meaning of a head noun so we get no conflict here. So in this story, uh, the meanings of these constructions are learned from experience with them. There's no, there's, there's less of a learnability problem. We're not postulating that the learning is a constraint on unbounded movement. It's constructivist, bottom up, trying to learn how to cover what's been said. Okay, it's not trying to learn a top-down constraint, which applies generally to block things. Okay, so a couple more slides here. Uh, this story allows A, B, and E. Which car the baseball player like? Which car the baseball pair baseball player like the color of? And you know which car to like the baseball player because um, you know the focused element in each is the focus. You know, uh, and each is the in the focus domain for the focused element in each is the focus of the clause. But in, in uh, C and D, the focus domain for the focused element is, uh, but C and D are no good because the focus domain of the focused element is the subject, which is backgrounded and there's a conflict. Okay. And then that's not a problem for, for F because we don't have the same meaning here. I have just, you know, we have parallel experiments in French showing exactly the same effects. I'm not going to read those examples, but these are French examples showing this. We do this in both WH questions and relative clauses, find the same pattern. Actually, Sprouse et al. found the same pattern in Italian and didn't explain it, but uh, uh, we think it's just due to conflict between focus and background. Um, and this theory makes a lot of interesting predictions, some of which we've tested. Um, it makes First, the theory predicts a graded extractions from noun phrases and object positions according to the backgroundedness of the noun phrase. This is an, actually an old observation in the syntax literature going back to Erdtik Scheer. So it's better to say which actress did you buy a picture of than which actress did you buy that picture of. If you make the thing you're trying to focus a backgrounded thing, it's you get a conflict, which is what we would expect. We also predict this should go away in relative clauses, which is something that people have observed in the literature. This is the actress who I bought a picture of versus the act this is the actress who I bought that picture of. There's not much of a contrast there, if any. I don't get any, but I haven't done the experiment. Um, and this theory also predicts an improvement across in extractions from subject position when the extracted position is focused, if you, which you can do. The topic doesn't have to be uh, unfocused, doesn't have to be background. So I can use even and only, I can say, and so I can make this, which is kind of bad, which car, car did the color of please the baseball player, I can make it pretty good by saying which car did even the color of please the baseball player or which car did only the color of please the baseball player. And we have some experimental evidence documenting that in a recent MLAP um, conference. Finally, uh, we've investigated recently uh, extractions from parts of adjuncts, which are also proposed to be um, ungrammatical, impossible by uh, sort of the, the island Chomsky way of thinking about things. Once again, we find extraction from part of an adjunct is bad in a WH question. There's, there's an interaction here. It's the same interaction, kind of the same interaction we've seen otherwise. Extraction in these if cases. So it's, um, here's the extract. Which concert would Paul worry if I might miss? But that goes away in a, in a relative clause. And so that is here, Paul told me about a concert which he would worry if I might miss is, is much better. And there's, so you get some interaction here, the island interaction here, that goes away in relative clauses, you get a three-way interaction in, in case you care about the statistics of these things. And so there's a big difference in constructions. So finally, on this, this uh, that's the final result here. I'm just summarizing now. Um, in the constructivist approach to islands, so some islands are sensitive. We've shown that to lexical frequency, we've explained the lexicon. Subject and adjunct islands may do depend, uh, their acceptability depends on the construction. These are construction dependent, not purely syntactic. We get similar results across the languages that we've been able to look at. You know, this is very different from the earlier work. We can get, we can't get corpus data, big broad corpus data here. You have to run these very fine grained experiments in every language. And that's kind of a little slower going, but um, is it, you know, long term is a, to look at more languages. And, and my conjecture here is that for other islands that experiments just haven't been done right so far, they're confounded. Uh, and we, we want, 
that's possible. I mean, I, of course, I could be wrong. Uh, of course, could, there could be something which is syntax independent, but that's you know my conjecture at the at the moment. Um, you know, we do need good experiments. Uh, and I just want to say, there's still no. I still think just finding a super additive interaction doesn't doesn't mean it's syntax, right? You need to show that it's syntax. You need some independent evidence. I don't think we that's been shown yet. Final, and so this is my summary. What I've done today, I've covered these topics. Words, words are short when they're possible, when, when predictable. Words um, get introduced to talk about a domain uh, that you need to talk about. Uh, and sentence structure is easy on memory and production. And I've given you the starts of a constructivist form meaning when I mean, really it's a, you know, it's a Adele Goldberg's and, and Ray Jackendoff's kind of theory here building on them. And I want to thank all these people, Steve Piantadosi predominantly for word length stuff. Uh, color words, I want to thank Bevel Conway and uh, Richard Futrell. In syntax, dependency length, I need to thank um, Richard Futrell again and uh, and Kyle Mohawald. In the island stuff, Anna Baye, Barbara Henforth, Elodie Winkle, and Ng Tong Liu have been fundamental there. And I'm not done with the intro. I just want to acknowledge people in my cognitive science community, collaborators, and hope, hope people who will be collaborators, I hope, in the future. Some of those are my some students and other collaborators I work with. And then linguists, uh, many, many linguists over, over many years who I've read so many things of, which are so uh, fascinating, including, you know, predominantly here, Nomi Urchishir and, um, and Adele Goldberg, Dan Everett, Ray Jackendoff, um, and, uh, you know, and, and Noam Chomsky, you know, I, I don't agree with his conclusions, but man, the, the hypotheses are really interesting. And I don't really like his cranky style, frankly, but what do you do? And of course, Claude Shannon. And then, then I'm going to finally stop. <laughs> and we can have some questions. Again, Thank you, Ted. Minutes longer. Oh, no, that's great. Thank you very much. We really appreciate it. OK, I'm happy to um, open this up to the floor. Um, Ted, maybe we can kill your slides so we can get, yeah, that's great. And um, if the uh, panelists wouldn't mind putting on their, um, oh, and I'm going to just um, spotlight. Give me one second. I'm going to spotlight our interpreter. Hold on a second. Uh, spotlight. and. Great. Uh, great. Um, so um, let's open it up to our um, panelists, especially our external panelists first. Um, does somebody want to jump in first, Martin, Adele, um, or David? I'm sure there's lots there to talk about. How about somebody just turns it on then? Um, go go, uh, go ahead, Adele, maybe we, we, okay. we can do this um, in the order. Well, I thought this was a great talk. I think this is exactly what um, we need more of is to explain cross-linguistic generalizations in functional terms of various kinds. Um, and I think, so, um, you know, a lot of ideas came to mind. One, one thing um, about the predictability um, leads to shortness. I wonder if you could also speak to uh, null, it, you know, when we don't, we don't use any language at all. So, uh, you know, it's well known that we often omit a, a um, you know, across languages, right? We languages tend to omit a pronominal referent if it tends to be predictable. So, you know, he washed. You don't have to say he washed himself, but if you say um, if you if it's not predictable, like kick, you don't tend to kick yourself. So, if you mean to say that, you have to use a longer um, a longer uh, pronoun. So, I just wondered if you wanted to include. Um, you know, pronouns and omitted elements uh, in the more predictable, shorter generalization. I, I think it will be a different. Uh, I, I mean, I, I, I get your. I, I think there's a there's an analysis there to be done. I don't think it's the same analysis, but there's like some other information theoretic analysis which might very well be used to. You know, I, I have your same intuition. I mean, that's a standard old intuition that predictable things get omitted. And so then there's got to be some information theoretic way kind of of doing that. I, I don't think you can do, uh, you know, a word length there quite on its own. But I think you're right that, that, that I mean, I just, someone must have yeah. done this, actually. Someone, some some information theory person must have done this. And there's probably someone here in the comments will be able to like, I don't know, Richard's probably done this. Richard Futrell has probably done something. Which, which tried to do what you're saying quantitatively across languages in some way or other. And I don't know exactly, I, I haven't got any, anything uh, fancy to say for how to solve that problem, but I completely agree with the intuition. Uh, yes, yeah, so the information theory in general, the information theory approach should explain many, I've just talked about a few things here, 
relationship, it should potentially explain many aspects of why languages look the way they, they do. And so another one, which I didn't talk about at all, um, you know, in part because we, you know, we only have kind of very uh, rough evidence for it is sort of the existence of whether, whether a language has, um, well, what's the point of having morphology in some ways, you know, case marking and some, you know, case marking might be helpful to help uh, disambiguate, you know, who's doing what to, to whom. It's kind of a, an extra marker to let you know, you know, what role those people play in whatever um, action we're talking about. These are like extra words you don't, you don't have to say in some languages, like English, you don't have hardly any case marking. And maybe that's because there's some trade off here between word order and, and you know, reliability of word order and, and case marking, you know, and, and morphology more generally. And so we do have, you know, we have some I have some suggestion, suggestive evidence there, but um, it's not the same as your case of pronouns, which I think is, you know, an interesting case to explore. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't have anything really exciting to say. No, there. no. Okay. Martin? Oh, yeah. We'll come back to David here in a sec. Go ahead, Martin. Yeah, maybe David was first, but I had something. Oh, I didn't see. Sorry. I have something to say specifically on the example oh. that Adele gave. Yeah. Martin might know exactly. Uh, namely, the reflexive. You know, I have a 2008 paper on uh, reflexive marking, and I didn't use any fancy statistics there or so. But but I think the solution uh, basically is not to look at um, <clears throat> lengths of words only, but also to look at lengths of constructions. Uh, so you know, in your talk, you uh, talked about words and sentences, but they're kind of all constructions, right? And so, I mean, in, in corpora, especially in written corpora, you know, orthographic language, we can easily count the length of words and it's more difficult to individuate constructions, but wouldn't that be a solution? Well, a, a solution to what? Well, I, mean, I, I agree uh, with, like, what, what's the puzzle that you it wanna... Would, it would bring together uh, yeah. The zero that Adele mentioned, oh, 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 okay. uh, and the and the shortness versus length that you talked about. You talked about words, uh, but, but when you talk about constructions, when you say you know he kicked himself, he washed, then um, you know you can compare them and you can say that he washed is a shorter construction than he kicked himself. Yeah. 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 I mean, I'll I'll say yes. <laughs> I just you know I need to see the details, but I'm. I, I, I get the intuition in some rough way, yes. David, David, thank you. I also really enjoyed the talk and I think it's quite a sort of minimalist thing to do actually to attempt to make sure that there are other kinds of explanations for what are apparently syntactic facts. So I think it's great to push forward on these ideas. I have two questions, one sort of a more general one and one a bit of a picky syntactician's question about your subject islands, which I thought was fascinating work. Um, the, the more general one is really connected again to the dependency length issue. So I've always been intrigued why it is that the, short, the shortest dependency lengths should sort of be adjacent elements and why we don't find, for example, subject uh, verb agreement caring about the adjacent noun phrase, as opposed to the whole subject as the dependent of the verb. But there's, why, are, why isn't adjacency the relevant dependent? That's the first question. And I'll, and I'll just add the second. Okay, can I that one? So, sorry? Okay, can, I, can we do, so I don't forget, can I just? Yeah, let's go for that, okay. <laughs> nested structures are harder than uh, non-nested. Very Locality. true. So anyway. <laughs> It's true in answering questions too. So um, yeah, I, I think what you're saying is like, I, I believe in structure. So I, you know, you're, you know, I, I think there's a lot of evidence for structure. And so, you know, so it's not just the most local end point of a subject that is doing the agreement. It, yes, there's a head. So I, um, all, of, you know, I, it's interesting. Some, sometimes people, you know, not, not you, but some people, um, go further than, than I'm going uh, here, way further and say, there's no structure to language. And I've never said that. And I don't ever intend that, you know, that seems, that seems like a little crazy thing to say. There's a lot of structure to language. And so the dependency structures are between heads and their dependents. So there's a head, which is the head noun, whatever that is, and, and, the, uh, and the verb, right? And so then you're gonna have agreement there. You're not gonna have agreement 
um, to whatever the last word happened to be there. So I'm, I'm not forsaking syntax. Everything I've ever said is about there being syntax. And so there's things like constituency. We know about constituency tests. They're not the nonsense. They're real things. And uh, you know, how do we account for those? Where do they come from? Information theoretically is a kind of an interesting question. You know, so you know, but accept the, you know, the the uh, evidence that these things are real. And so that's that's my answer to your question. So I, I think we're not in. You know, I, it's another. Th just 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 let me go on for one second more. It's like people get when I talk. I work. I didn't talk about noisy channeling, which is a big information theory approach to how people you know produce and understand language. It's like there's a lot of noise in the input, and and people get. A little bit, people think I, that's sort of anti-syntax in some way, and it's really not. It's actually so pro-syntax because it's saying there is a grammar, and what matters is how close, what, you know, the things that you heard are to uh, the things that you are you think are real, like the, those things in your grammar. So it really, there's probabilities in that grammar, you know. So that doesn't mean there's a, there's a lot of probabilities in that grammar, and so there's more likely and less likely, but there's a grammar, and so that's like you know so. Um, I think we're probably not on very different terms, you, you and me. I'm sure that's absolutely right. I guess my question was really more, why isn't it the case that the dependency is adjacency? If you take a general perspective that it is use, communication, what you hear, all yeah. that kind of stuff, why, why then do we have, and maybe this is the question you were, the last point you just made, why do we have syntactic structures if really things are fundamentally surface and usage based? So, so the answer there is, is probably, I don't, have a, I don't have a good answer, but the, the answer is in terms of probably learning. So there's something simpler you know, to kids learning a language or to us learning a language is have rules. There have to be rules. If there's no rules, then, uh, then it's probably much harder to learn. But I, but I grant you, and I, you know, that's like a very hand wavy answer. But I think, you know, that's not straight communication, right? That's not about communication. That's about simplicity. There is a simplicity of, of, of the system that has to be learned. And so there have to, so that's where we don't see the in the dependency length minimization that they're not on the on the floor there. They can't be on the floor because there are rules of English, and they just can't get to the floor sometimes, or whatever the language is. They're, you can't, if you had free word order, if you had true free word order, then you could get to the floor, but you, but you don't in any language. You yeah. don't have, yeah, yeah, yeah. Very, can I just squeeze in this last little picky Please. syntax question? Cause I'm Absolutely. actually really- You're allowed 10 minutes apparently. Answer. Or five minutes. Yeah, so like in your cases where you had PP extraction from subjects inside relative clauses. Yes. Did you control for, uh, pars of something like, you know, the uh, car of which the color I like or whatever it is, those kinds of cases. Did you control for a pars of that where of which the color is a constituent such so that of which is not moved to the WH position, but it stayed within the subject DP and then the whole DP has moved I mean, again, we're just using movement as a metaphor, right? Move yeah. to the initial position. So that would, I think, explain what I think are in your graphs, where you had a difference between the extraction of the, of the um, WHPP from a subject versus from an object, because that pars wouldn't be available for the object. So I'm wondering if that might, if you controlled for that, by, for example, making sure the subject was separated from the extracted PP by an adverb, say, and then you wouldn't be able to have that part. Does that make sense? Um, I'm sure it does. <laughs> um, but, you know, um, I'm going to, there's, there's a, there's a um, my, my expertise in this project isn't perfect. And so I, I have heard this question before, and I've heard Anna Baye answer it well. And um, I don't, I'm not sure if I can do it perfectly here. And okay, so, no um, but the, but you know, it's the, the examples are not all of which, in case that's important. 
Um, and so they, they're, they vary on the prepositional phrase that changes, that doesn't matter to you. Okay. I'm just not sure what these things. So we have these Don't other. Worry. I think Anne might be uh, answering it in the chat. Oh, so maybe I will Thank continue you, in the chat and pass on to the next question. Thanks very much, Chad. There we go. Thank you, David. Go. Um, do, does, does, does Martin have a, oh, let me just shift the um, spotlight here. Does, does, does Martin, um, do you have a, uh, any follow-ups before we move on? You only had a short question. Um, yes, yeah, I had, I had a, an, another related question actually, um, you know, because, you know, as I said, you talk about words and uh, you talked about sentences um, <clears throat> and you had sort of two uh, different ways of uh, explaining the, the words. You talked about uh, word lengths in corpora, and then you talked about uh, uh, words for color terms, and and the explanation was sort of both in terms of efficiency, once uh, in terms of predictability, the other one you said words exist to describe objects and properties that we need to talk about. So, and I'm wondering if they couldn't be collapsed, uh, if we, uh, you know, say you know extend our view to expressions for colors that are not just words but longer things so you know we, we have not just blue in english we also have bluish or light blue or sky blue or maybe blue like the sky and and so on so so couldn't we say perhaps that uh, the expression uh, for colors is shorter when the colors are you know warm used more frequently you know you said warm colors uh, are the more useful ones so they should be occur more frequently in corpora and therefore should be shorter so so isn't it really the same uh, kind of phenomenon i mean i um <clears throat> it's possible i'm i'm uh, i'm i'm not you know i'm i'm uh, you might be right uh, I need to see the math for see how to do that. If we could collapse it, I um, they're they're both very information theoretic. I'm just not sure if it's the same if if you can do it in one in one formula kind of thing. It's what I just don't know. Um, I'm happy if you can. Um, I we are I'm not making any claim here uh, <clears throat> for having the right formulas. You know you know as I say the formulas we're using the kinds of math I was using in our color stuff for example. Is not this? It's it's very close, but it's not the same as Noga. Noga Zoslaski, who's doing these information bottleneck kind of things, they're close, but they're but they're not in you know, yet. So you know, I've talked a lot to her about how to do, you know, how to do this, uh, um, how to do these, uh, how, how to do uh, uh, um, information passing in terms of the communication theory. And so maybe maybe, you know, you have some intuition there that we can uh, that we you know I, I can talk to her about how to. How to formalize she's like my real expert i guess yeah, i guess, I guess my, my, doing. my intuition is also colored yeah. by uh you know somehow not wanting to distinguish between uh, uh words and sentences you know i think in terms of you know construction i know i know i i agree yeah. i agree with that intuition entirely i i don't I, I you know constructions in general is a nice way to go i completely yeah, agree. yeah. and and uh you know this color term yes, right of course, very is nice much based on kind of lexical typology and you yeah. know people don't yes. think yeah. so much in terms of kind of simply longer larger ways of of saying things and it seems yes. to me that also some of the other work by uh, terry regeer and charles kemp and others uh, is probably susceptible to that kind of analysis so think of yeah. kinship terms for example you know they uh, you know the more frequent kinship terms are uh, the shorter ones like mom and dad and and son and daughter and so on and then we have uh, grandmother and great grandmother and so on and they are kind of right. excessively more complex uh, but they're also less useful, less frequent in discourse, as Greenberg pointed out, and so on. So I'm kind of thinking that maybe this can be actually reduced to a kind of Zipfian uh, thinking. Yeah, you're, I, I think you're right. I mean, I, I share the intuition, but I, I mean, maybe we can get someone to do it, <laughs> to do the math and do that thing. So there probably is so many people listening here that someone will start doing it. Uh, when, because like, uh, that would be kind of fun. Could I just follow up on yes, please, Martin's please. point? Uh, um, because I think when when you think about constituent structure, I, I wouldn't um, cast that off to pure syntax either. The, so the constituent structure is always about treating some some 
some combination of words as a semantic unit, right? It's always picking out a semantic unit. That's what it's for. So it also has a function. All the tests for constituency are really semantic tests. So, you know, I think, I think you can really push the view to say, it's not just words, it's not just sentences, it includes constituent structure, collocations. You can really treat all of these, I think, the same, the same way and they're, they're subject to the same principles. I mean, the reason I was breaking these things up was, you know, they're like the, the words, the word sections, whatever morpheme word sections are, were, was in, you know, these are just sort of unbreakable pieces of meaning. Like there's no composition there. I, I mean, I was, that, and so the other ones are places where there's composition. And so that, that's how I was breaking it between sort of here's our fundamental, I don't know, the building blocks and the things we put together, I guess, your points, both of you, is that you know constructions have meaning, uh, uh, you know, which are kind of the building blocks also. And so it's not like, you know, they they come with their own meanings associated with them. And so we can't. So there maybe maybe we can just do this in all one system is the point in some way. I could think about that. Adele, you can tell us next week how to do that. No, Odo says no. Jeanette, do you have a question? I think you do. Thank uh, you. Yes, I had a couple of shortest questions, but I just I just go with, with one of them. Um, I was thinking the, the the first study where you talked about how predictability predicts uh, word length. Might you also expect that to extend to languages that have characters, so Chinese and Japanese, in terms of predictability, predicting simplicity of character, possibly? I guess so. Yeah. I mean, depending on how those. Yeah, I guess so. I don't know how the. I don't know what the. Uh, I mean, I, I mean, I, 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 this certainly makes sense. <laughs> if, the, yeah. if, if you want to save effort in your writing and you want to write the things that are like the fewer strokes you can do, the better, right? Uh, for things which you do most, most often. So uh, yeah, I, I actually, that's a very interesting point. I haven't seen that done, uh, that analysis. It's mm. probably been done, but I don't know. But <laughs> I, I agree, it's a neat idea. Mm. Yeah. I, I'd know the really short question, but I'm happy to let somebody else go if they've got a question. Go, go ahead, Jeanette, please. And then, and then we'll take Adam next. Okay, it was, it was relating to your second study where you talked about how the warm colors tend to be objects standing out against a, a cold colored background. And I was also thinking, looking at that range of colors um, of, of, of what you had with, with the warm colors, I was also thinking, to what extent is, is it also because they're animate objects and therefore have got maybe more agency? I'm thinking of like brown, red, pink, you know, humans, animals, etc. I mean, it's probably related. I mean, I, I don't know. In our, if you're talk, talking about why are there color terms in a language, I don't. I mean, it's the, our story. The story there. I don't know if it's right or not. Is that it's got to do with when you have two objects which are identical, and you need to be able to tell. I need a word to tell you it's this one and not that one. So, you know, in the modern world, that's really obvious. There's lots of times when things are really identical, except for color, and so I need words for these things. And then. In the you know the remote world is not so obvious when those where those examples come from. So mm -hmm. they do happen, and so there are like it's so people often think first examples people think of are things like fruit and stuff where you know you've got a green banana versus a yellow banana versus a brown banana. But those are bad examples because mm -hmm. the function and the you know even though they may look kind of similar on the surface, they are really functionally very different. And you know so we need so these ripe versus unripe. You know you don't have to talk about color there and so and there's probably other slight textural differences which are mm -hmm. uh which are actually visually salient there but there are examples of items in the in the natural world which are pretty identical and those are like for example animals there are examples of you know, like you know animals which are just you know there's a you can have a black goat and a white goat and uh yeah. and so then maybe you need words for black and white when you have two animals which are identical except for color i mean to, to the extent they're not identical of course but uh, you know, two animals are different animals, but to the extent you're thinking of them as farm animals and they're not your friends, you know, <laughs> then you need like your friends, of course, you care about their identity as opposed to their their objecthood in the world. And so there there are these examples, but they're just they're kind of, you know, they they actually do happen to occur in an you know, inanimate thing. So it's so a color of fur is like is a place where this does happen. Uh, um, so color of, an, you know, color of animals, but otherwise, 
you know, so mostly flowers and berries and stuff, almost everything along those dimensions, there's other, there's other things which are different. They're never exactly the same. I mean, they look the same to us. <laughs> if you're going, if I go down the Chimani and look in the jungle and in, in, uh, there, they, things will look very similar to me. And we, I've actually run experiments where we've given people eye tracking studies with two, two spiders, which look identical to us, but just different colors. And they're like, no, no, that's a something spider. And that's a something, you know, that's something else. They're totally different because, because, you know, they know what the function of those things are. They're very different for them. And so, uh, so anyway. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. You're welcome. Adam, do you have a question? I mean, we're, we're going to run about five minutes or so over here since we had a late start on, 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 on the session. I don't think Zoom's going to kick us off, but I guess if it does, we'll all know what happened. Adam? Hi, uh, great talk. I enjoyed it very much. Um, just on the uh, predictability thing, mm -hmm. um, we're still at the beginning of creating sign language corpora, so we don't really have corpora that are large enough to do this kind of work, but we have started looking at and, uh, and coming up with ways to operationalize sign length are also challenges that we haven't uh, started to think about yet. But certainly we've already found uh, that there's a relationship in this in three sign language corpora that we've looked at um, for uh, frequency and duration of signs. So we do find that obviously more frequent signs are shorter in duration. And that made me think about your about the relationship between word length and predictability, because obviously that would come about over time through shorter durations of yeah. predictable elements. So have you actually tested that? Have you looked at whether the same word in more predictable contexts is shorter in duration? Um, I, I know, uh, because the, the corp when we're talking about these big corpora, these are all written corpora as opposed to spoken corpora. And so, uh, you know. He did, for, or, or Steve did, right? With the television, TV, there was an experiment, right? Like when do people use Oh, but that's, um, so, so yeah, so you're talking about Kyle. So it's Kyle Mahowal, Mahowal did this experiment where you look at these differences in a bunch of words, which differ in their, it mean the same thing, but differ in their lengths. So in English, there's a bunch of these examples where, I mean, it, you know, TV is not a great example, but that's kind of one TV television, but it's like more like, you know, chimp, chimpanzee. Um, uh, there's a bunch of these, I can't think of, uh, Many of them off. To, I've, I've got all the animal ones popping into my head. There's hippo and hippopotamus and rhino and rhinoceros. I don't know why there's a few of these animal ones, but there's other a whole bunch of other math mathematics. There's a bunch of these things like this where there's two terms which mean which are still around and still mean the same thing. And then you can show what Kyle showed was that the um, the contexts which um, where the short form was used are in more predictable environments than the context in which the long long form was used. That's that's related. You know, it's not quite duration. I mean, it's kind of related, I guess this is typing. So there's, but this this paper by, um, what's her name? Uh, Jasmine Conwall from 2017 in Cognition. It's, it's from Simon Kirby's group is a neat paper showing uh, um, the, okay, it, that, that's about duration there. That's actually about a spoken language. It's an experiment, so it's not real language, but it's over time how, showing how, if there's a need for communication being, being right, getting the thing right, and there's a time pressure, then this happens. Then you get, then this is like basically showing how it happens over time. Then it, then it, then the words get shorter over time. Otherwise, um, there, if there's no time pressure, and of course, if accuracy is not important, nothing changes. But if it doesn't really matter if the information gets across. That doesn't matter. But also, if time is important, then then it doesn't happen either. This is, I mean, that's suggestive, right? Because that's an experiment and it's not really about human language quite, but you know, those are, you know, that's what you can do in these cases. So, yeah. Martin. Can I just briefly say, I think there's quite a bit of uh, work also on links in corpora, actually going back to the 1990s or even uh, earlier. And there, there was a, a sort of widely cited paper by Susanne Gahl and, and others on the time. Oh, yes, 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 you're absolutely right. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. so and, you and know, Herf, when Herf 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 first this plan, which is a very rare one, also, you know, also graphically, yeah. interestingly, it's longer, right? It has a Y instead of an I and so on. So, so these kinds of effects have been studied there, there you know, not just by, not by Ted and his no, no, no. Uh, group. No, but by well before, so Turk and Islet is actually sort of the standard site for that. So that's Alice Turk and uh, whatever. So which is that, um, that words get shortened in predictable context, basically. That's roughly what that paper shows. I'm, you know, I sort of freeze 
<laughs> in the context of all these people and all over, I forget stuff, but you're absolutely right, Martin. I, I apologize for not remembering some stuff on top of my head there. Yeah. Can we just take a, um, a last question from Dagmar? I, I, I'm afraid yes. for the audience members, I'm, I, I do have the questions there. I think there's some really interesting ones actually. Maybe Ted, maybe Ted takes a quick look and see if there's any he wants to, to quickly address here at the end, but let's just take a question from Dagmar. There's also some questions on YouTube. I'm sorry, we won't be able to get to those tonight. Uh, Dagmar? Yeah, I'm going to, I had the same question going back to the predictability, the frequency thing, the Zipfian, the dynamic perspective. So I quite like these explanations, but I also always wonder, and I was wondering whether you had a view on that. How do these systems, how do systems like that come about? Because what we see when we study corpora, this is snapshots taken at this point in time based on written data where you don't really see the, the abbreviations, the shortenings as much as in, as in a spoken language. So... But basically, by which mechanisms do you think that shorter words end up in these more predictable positions? Um, well, I, I mean, I, I don't think I'm going to have a good answer to that other than that, you know, so I'm going to pitch Jasmine Kenwell's paper again, which shows there's something that, that that's happening when you need, uh, when there's a pressure on time and when there's a, and there's a pressure for accuracy. Now, what is the specific mechanism for making that happen? I imagine there's a bunch of mechanisms that would be consistent with that in some way or other. And I, uh, I, don't, I don't have a, a good answer for that. I'm sorry. Sorry. <laughs> I don't know. Do you have something to, I mean, I like the construction grammar kind of a point of view, but I'm not sure if it's, uh, it's going to distinguish multiple accounts here. So, so I'm sorry. I don't have anything deep to say there. Ted, Ted, do you have? I mean, I mean, I'm I'm not personally in a rush, and obviously people can yeah. can drop off here. Um, do you, do you, uh, of, the, of the questions and answers you, on the um, yeah, no, sure. you need to think about the interpreters though. So. Yes, okay, well, <laughs> that's right, that's right. Um, okay, let's give us a couple more minutes here, if that's okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, oh, any any on the question answers that really um jump out at you? Can, can someone? I have been um, you know, talking and not reading, and I'm not. Yeah, good, there's uh, only three. So the first one was about oh, kind of. Oh, Q and A. Here we go. Yeah, I'm looking I think there's just three there. Um, I'm sorry, I was looking in the chat. There. Yes, right, right, right. <laughs> the future words. Yes, it varies. I mean, the second one's just sort of a methodological question about the about the colors you had on the kind of checkerboard. I believed, uh, I believe about. Um, do you think that would have any effect? Oh, 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 well, yeah, that's just a methodological thing. No, so, um, yeah. Um, and then Mark has that, a question. That, that's, that's not, uh, you know, that's a misrepresentation. So actually, the, the, I mean, the, the chips are typically presented for us. They're presented against a white background yeah, yeah. In, with, with fixed lighting conditions. Right, right. And so we fixed the lighting conditions. No one else has done that. But I have this vision scientist that I work with, Bevel Conway, and he insisted on me bringing a, a light box down to the, down to the jungle, to, in which I had, I had to carry on a car battery all the time to power that thing. And so, um, and so then we get, because I, you know, if you're interested in color, um, different environments give rise to different perceptions of color, right? So you, you know, just think of the dress. If you, from a few years ago, there's different perceptions of what you, what colors you think you see there. That's some, there, you know, it's hitting the eye in exactly the same way across different people. And yet people think of that dress as being either whatever it was, gold and, um, white, I think, or blue and black, you know, it's very quite remarkable, the different perception there. And so we, you know, Kyle, uh, uh, so Bevel was insistent that we carry, I carry, I, I, I don't know if it really mattered, frankly, very much across these things, but mm -hmm. I, I, so let's go with, a, Mark has a question here. What is this? What is his? Yeah, so sort of about I, sort of what it, comes first here. Mm -hmm. Dependency minimization versus head directionality. I mean, how do we sort of, how do we establish kind of which, which way the causation goes there, I think is the gist of the question. Oh, well, I, I mean, I, I don't, you know, my rough answer for that is, um, there are ways to tell, you know, any specific theory will have make its own predictions, right? So any specific theory. So, so Hawkins theory is a specific theory, which is very close to dependency length minimization, but it's not actually dependency length minimization. And so you can pull them apart in interesting ways. Um, and so Davy Temperley pulled them apart in interesting ways in English and showed that in English, in the way that, um, I, I don't know what if it's his data, or I think there was, must be 
corpus data, but they are much better predicted by dependency length minimization than by the Hawkins proposal. Um, so, so it's so so I mean, but you know, that's just going to kind of be the simplest theory, I think, in some ways here, like that that covers the most phenomena. It doesn't really mean that it's right in this case. And so, um, oh, 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 so. <laughs> That's right. Al, I don't know who else is here. Has mentioned creating a program that could generate trillions of possible languages. That was when I was working a long time ago, um, about 20 years ago, when I was just first started at MIT, and I was working in the principles and parameters framework. And we were trying to. That was like a, a, a an interesting way. I I mean I, I think it's still around in some ways, in that in that kind of formalism to try and think of the why languages vary across the world's languages. And so we were taking people's, other people's principles uh, and their parameters and trying to implement that and build a grammar, uh, and a sort of a, a universal grammar of all the possible word orders. That was the idea. And um, I just didn't find it gave me any insights. That was my, uh, and, and it ended up generating trillions of grammars of which, you know, there are only 7,000 languages that exist right now. And maybe there's tens of thousands or something that have ever existed. I've gotten, you know, um, Damian Blasi tells me he's got some way of figuring out how many languages ever existed in some way, but it's not millions. It's on the order of tens of thousands at the most. And so not that that's a reason, maybe, maybe millions are possible. Maybe trillions are possible. I don't know. It's just, I didn't get any insights out of that program. And, and we didn't, and we also didn't do coverage either. We actually didn't cover the actual languages. Not only did we get, it was just kind of not a very, I just didn't, didn't go somewhere that I wanted to continue. <laughs> not that it's wrong. It's hard to prove it's wrong because it was just one failed attempt. That, and who's to know that it actually failed? And we didn't publish it for weird reasons. Uh, this is anyway, which I won't go into here publicly. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Ted. I mean, I think we're gonna need to wrap up. That was great. I really appreciate the discussion. Um, I'm sorry we couldn't get to all the questions, especially on YouTube. Um, I'll forward those on to Ted for, for yeah, the record. I would love to see them. Yeah, yeah. We, we had about 70 people there on YouTube watching as well. So that will all be um, put up there and, and, and archived there as well. Um, I'd like to say thank you to everyone for showing up this week. It's uh, really been great. Um, I'm really looking forward to next week as well with, with, with Adele. So same time, same place. And we'll try to work out some of these little bugs and get the question answers visible to everyone and stuff like that. Um, we really appreciate your time, Ted. That was a great talk and uh, really exciting. I, I only wish we had more time uh, for questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> we'll see you all next week. Um, talk soon. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.